Our scripture for this morning is taken from the gospel according to Luke chapter 24 verses from 13 to 34. But allow me to read till verses 35. I've been debating if I should read the whole uh, passage or should I pick, but then I felt that it will be good to hear the whole entire narrative in this in this uh, passage. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to become them to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, I am not sure if you know this, but we are currently in an election season. (laughs) Maybe you try to stick your head in the sand as I sometimes want to do, but the fear and the uncertainty are in the air. And things are so polarized, it seems there is no way we can be in any agreement on the small stuff, let alone who is 
president. Imagine you were on a walk with someone who was from the opposing, uh, uh, opposing political parties or stands. What will you do? Will you run ahead and try to lose them? <laughs> will you talk about the weather or other insignificant things? Will you try to have a political conversation? Will you defend and argue your political stance? Or will you just walk in silence? I wonder what will happen if you ask that person where it hurts. Where are they experiencing pain and grief? I also wonder what will happen if you have the courage to share your own struggles and pain. How will things change? What will happen to that fear and, 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 and anxiety in the air? A scripture informs us that two disciples were on their way to Emmaus. Now, we are not sure why these two disciples were trying or were traveling to Emmaus. Most of Luke's narratives right from the beginning talks about people traveling to Jerusalem, the place where, according to the Jewish beliefs, God resides. It may be that they have seen their teacher crucified and they are leaving Jerusalem because there's no much left for them there. They are walking away and maybe returning to a previous livelihood, as most of us will do. Luke doesn't explain to us why, except to say that they are grieved from what they had experienced, what they have experienced. A Friedrich Buechner, in his book, the Magnificent Defeat interprets Emmaus as a place, I will quote, the place we go to in order to escape a bar, a movie, wherever it is, where throw our, up our hands and say, let the whole damn thing go hang. It makes no difference anyway. Emmaus may be buying a new suit or a new car, or smoking more cigarettes than you really want, or reading a second-rate novel, or even writing one. Emmaus may be going to church on Sunday. Emmaus is, where, is wherever or whatever we do to make ourselves forget that the whole world holds nothing sacred. The disciples told the stranger that walked with them. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. These disciples gave up their livelihoods. They left their homes all to follow this Jesus whom they thought was the Messiah. And now that journey is all over and it ended in a horrific and terrible crucifixion, and his body is missing. It is not what they had hoped for. That phrase, but we had hope, is a daunting one in our lives because it is something, it is something we all see when we were expecting something. We have worked hard and waited for months or even years, and that something never came. It never was. We see it when tested were fail, when tests were fails or rejection letters come in the mail, we had hope. When our break doesn't come or we don't get the job, we had hope. When the election result doesn't turn out the way we had expected, we had hope. 
when we pour all our love and, and our energy into our children and they still make colossal mistakes we had hope the list goes on to loved ones dealing with addiction or failed business venture or a failed marriage or relationship we have all been there and it can be painful we hope but things but then things don't turn out the way we had hoped it can be one of the most painful things to ever happen in anyone's lives yes yet it is here it is here while the disciples are running away running away from the pain and going in the wrong direction that jesus met and journey with them even in the wrong direction and he even spent the night and broke bread with them that jesus went with them is truly remarkable to think about because you and i were taught from a young age to stay clear of peers who are on the wrong path. In fact, what we find in Scripture is that this is what Jesus loves to do, to sit, to dine, to accompany people, especially the outcasts and the marginalized, even in their messiness of lives because he, before, he, before he does anything else. For Jesus, it seems building a relationship with each person he encounters and offering them respect is not only the first and the most important thing, but it is key to his life and his vocation. In our task-oriented culture, when we, when we think of our own calling or vocation, we automatically think of a task like what I need to do to help this person, or how will I change them? Literally, we are rewarded on how much tasks we accomplish, not so much on how we get to know our neighbor down the street, our visitors are at, f are at our food pantry or church, and even our colleagues at work. But Jesus, shows us the way and invites us to show up, to accompany and walk alongside the many individuals who have felt invisible and neglected for so long because their hopes and dreams have been dashed by corrupt and unjust systems. This sort of work doesn't check things of our to-do list, and it takes time. Now, being in, com uh, being in community or in relationship with someone, especially those who are different from us, is not an easy task because it requires us to be willing to set aside not only our own privilege, interests, and assumptions, but also to be willing to listen to the voice of those we accompany. We have to be willing to invite new ideas or perspectives in. It is so absurd to think that these two disciples cannot recognize the one they thought was the Messiah just three days before. We are not sure what kept the disciples from recognizing Jesus. From the way one of the disciples, Cleopas, responds to Jesus' question, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place there in these days? Suggests to us that maybe, maybe it is due partly to the fact that the disciples assume they know and understand more of what is going on than this stranger or outsider that you were talking to. I think this is a huge, huge mistake to make in our Christian life and vocation to assume that with all the resources, knowledge, and degrees we have, we already know what we need 
to know, and therefore we don't need some random stranger telling us what we should be doing or who we ought to be as a Christian community. We close ourselves off to learning and being surprised. Sadly, this tendency or assumption that we know everything has led the Christian church in the Western world throughout the centuries and even now to think that they have the answers to all the world's problems and perpetuate colonial assumptions and actions throughout the world. Yet, it's amazing to see how Jesus, though he was the only one who actually knew and understood everything of what was going on, didn't assume to know or understand what trouble the disciples had without asking them questions. By asking questions, Jesus opened the space for the disciples to describe themselves on their own terms and empowered them to speak up for themselves. It's interesting, if you look at Jesus' ministries, he always have questions to ask to the people he encounter before he do anything to them. I believe in our journey and vocation, we need to see those we encounter every day as fellow companions in our journey rather than just an object of our benevolence that needs our help. In this way, it helps us not to only meet people where they are, but also to journey alongside them amidst the struggles, to hear, to listen, to empower, to be patient, and to recognize that each individual brings strengths and gifts, but also concrete needs and personal brokenness to the space of encounter. A question we need to ask ourselves is, what if a mission or what if the mission of the church is not just something we do for the people in need, but, is, but it is something we do with the people we journey alongside with? My first job, when I first uh, moved into this country, this is moved to the country uh, in 2010, uh, my first job was to work at a ministry that provided a space to, show, uh, to socialize on Saturday nights for adults who had intellectual and developmental challenges. And this is back uh, at Princeton, uh, New Jersey. I had little experience with this particular, particular kind of population. Looking back, I don't even know how I got the job. At first, I was very anxious about what programs to create and how to help these individuals in relationship and life skills. Yet in the end, it was probably a gift that I was so un unqualified because I quickly learned that no one there wanted me to fix their problems. A deck of cards and a bunch of bananas was enough to meet all our needs. In, in this way, they were given autonomy and dignity to ask me for what they needed rather than me controlling them in how to be an act. This community wanted my friendship and accompaniment more than my wisdom or even direction. And honestly, I needed their friendship. I was new to the country and getting used to the lifestyle and language, and I felt free in the space to just be me. Friends, as we continue, as we continue to live in this polarized world, it is so easy for us to pick a side, to dehumanize one group over the other, to consider ourselves as better than others, and to choose fear over love. 
And when things we had hoped for are taken away from us, we can run away to a place like Emmaus, and we can start assuming what everyone is thinking and feeling. Or we can do the courageous thing. We can admit where it hurts. We can listen to our neighbors with openness and curiosity. God doesn't call us to a task, but to a conversation. God doesn't call us to a destination, but to a relationship. God doesn't call us to an achievement, but to a table where we can share a meal together. When it comes to our Christian calling, we can take all the personality tests and spend time by ourselves thinking of all the great things we could do. But listening and following our calling was never meant to be something we do by ourselves. Because we, because we are all created and strengthened by a relationship with God, we are called to be in relationship with those all around us from grocery store to playgrounds, dog uh, parks, and street corners. Friends, are we willing to take different roads with those who are different from us? Are we willing to be curious and open to surprises? Well, friends, this is a calling from Jesus Christ. Are we going to answer? Amen.